good morning everyone welcome to the uh, pico seminar series which is part of our pico electrodynamics theory network where, where we are trying to bring in uh, theorists and also some of the experimentalists working in the diverse area of the condensed matter physics quantum optics computational electrodynamics and many body physics and topological physics so this idea of this network is to bring in the collaboration uh, to uh, to look into this uh, light matter interaction deep inside the matter in the pico scales and uh, we had several seminars in this series uh, today we are uh, happy to have dr sean maleski from polytechnic montreal with us to talk about the work and now professor zubin jacob will introduce him thank you great thank you so much satvik uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, an alum from the group uh, who is actually doing exceptionally well uh, come back and talk to us about his latest uh, research. So we are very glad that we have uh, Professor Sean Moleski with us, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Engineering Physics at Polytechnic Montreal. And he also has a joint appointment with Ivado. Uh, so he obtained his PhD at the University of Alberta, uh, where he won many awards, including the Governor General's gold medal. Uh, he was also a visiting scholar at Purdue University in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. So he has a broad set of interests, uh, which lie at the intersection of photonics, optimization, uh, computational modeling. And uh, he's an expert in multiple areas, and we are very eager to uh, learn from him about his latest research on a dual perspective of uh, inverse design. So with that, um, and no further delay, uh, let's all welcome Sean and um, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Zubin. Uh, yeah. So thank you for inviting me. And I think this uh, people at Electrodynamics Theory Network is a really nice effort. And I'm very glad it started. I, I think there's a lot to learn by connecting these communities together. Uh, the topic I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit different than the previous seminars that I've watched. But I think there'll be enough through currents to hopefully keep your interest. So let's, let's see how it goes. Um, I am more on the computational modeling side. I have some interest in the theory of computation, the theory of optimization, and a kind of connections to, to that world, and how they mesh together with optics and inverse design. And so today I'm going to be talking about a dual perspective for inverse design, and I'll get into exactly what this means and rigorously what is this duality that we're talking about as we go through. OK, so. Uh, to set the stage for why this is an interesting topic, you have to first believe that inverse design is an interesting topic. And so I'm gonna start with that context. The idea of inverse design is actually quite simple. Uh, the, maybe the, the technical, how do you do it is a little complicated, but the why we wanna do it, the motivation is, is very straightforward. So as soon as you have the ability to model, to computationally model electromagnetics, um, really, you have the ability to do design in that same computational framework. And so what I mean by this is, say you have the objective of engineering something like the radiation emitted from a dipole, so the free space radiation coming out of a dipole, this is a lot of different applications. It's kind of a, a very fundamental quantity for nanophotonics. If you're able to model this in terms of small cells, well, why can't you think of each one of those cells as a design parameter? Uh, and then your engineering problem of trying to come up with a structure subject to some kind of constraints. So, you know, I need to build this thing out of some kind of specific materials, maybe a set of materials I have a choice over. It needs to fit into some kind of volume or size. All these things can then be framed as an optimization problem. So I have these constraints, they define a domain, just like they do in the computational domain. And then my object, the shape of the geometry that I, that I want to design, that I want to make finally to, to come up with a geometry for how to do this effectively, those can be described in terms of the same cells that I do the computational modeling with. And so I can treat each one of those things as a parameter. And then I can get the computer to come up with structures for me by framing this as an optimization problem. So if we look on the, the right, here's kind of some, some crazy looking structures that, that we got for this same problem. Uh, one is a kind of 3D view of, of a crazy structure. And then the other one is a cross cut. The, the specifics of what's going on, not that important for now, but just to say that it's really two sides of the same coin. As soon as you can do 
computational modeling, the idea that you can do inverse design is right there. And um, in terms of applications, this is a very, very broad idea. It's as broad as what you can apply modeling to. So kind of throughout applied science, you can use this idea of inverse design to come up with ways or structures, geometries, to accomplish some kind of task. So in terms of optics, this applies to not everything, but many different, many of the different applications we want to look at. So things like confinement, um, communication through a channel, light trapping, all these things can be framed in the mathematical framework of, I want to you know, maximize or minimize some kind of objective in terms of my fields. Those could be like from magnetic fields, they could be polarization currents. And to do this optimization and get some kind of device out of it, what I have to do is I have to find the best parameters where these parameters describe my structure, subject to the constraint that physics is correct. And uh, this quote unquote physics is correct becomes a little nebulous and it will actually be one of the things we're gonna take advantage of uh, to, to talk about the dual perspective. So over the, especially over the last 10 years, as computational approaches have grown more powerful, this use of uh, inverse design techniques to come up with structures has become more and more prevalent. And it's not just topology optimization, it can be machine learning, it can be any kind of optimization protocol you can think of, just applied to the idea that I'm going to describe my geometry in terms of some set of parameters. I'm going to describe my engineering objective in terms of some set of parameters. And then I'm going to apply optimization theory and, and some kind of techniques from optimization theory in order to come up with a design. And this has really, really taken off. Uh, it's kind of going faster and faster. And the performance that you get out of these designs tends to be much, much better than, than what you get it to. So that's, again, not always true, but in many cases, so in defining, designing cavities, def, designing splitters, and designing couplers, many kinds of different applications, people have used this technique and you generally find that what the computer is able to come up with is substantially better than, than what existed through kind of a combination of intuition and maybe some, we'll call it fine tweaking optimization where we, where we change a couple um, small parameters. And beyond just the performance, uh, this actually shows you some interesting things about what people are good at in terms of designs and what we're weak at. And um, so, that, so there's also kind of a very fundamental aspect to it too. So as an example, something our group did uh, now a while ago, 2016, was to apply this to enhancing second harmonic generation. Uh, so this is the idea, you come in with one frequency you're going to have some nonlinear media and it's going to transform it into a doubling of the frequency. And when you do this on a nanophotonic scale, you can kind of understand the second harmonic efficiency uh, in terms of a product that is not showing up. So sorry, I converted this presentation um, over from Windows to Linux this morning and apparently I missed that some little things are, are not here. But it turns out to be a product of the Q1, uh, the, qual the, cav the quality cavity factor, the ca quality factor of the cavity at the first frequency uh, squared, the quality factor of the cavity at the second frequency, and a absolute value squared of this beta parameter, where this beta parameter is like your nonlinear uh, overlap. So it's kind of like a selection rule. It's really the same thing as a, the field overlap or quasi-phase matching that you see when you, when you try to do these um, second harmonic generation applications in larger scale systems. And what you find is when you put it on a computer, uh, it tends to not like the, the, the standard techniques that, that we would normally use. So if you were to ask me to do this, I can't really think about how the fields overlap all that well. That's, that's very challenging. You know, you put a scatterer, the, the water waves, how does that picture look? It's very complicated to think about that, especially at two different frequencies and how all these, these waves overlap. So I would probably go about the problem by trying to design a cavity that has a high quality factor at the two different frequencies. That, that would be my technique. But um, when you do these kind of traditional designs, they often end up being that uh, in order to get a high quality factor cavity, 
you actually kind of use some symmetry principles. And those symmetry principles often kind of preclude a very good overlap between your uh, fundamental and second harmonic mode. What the computer does, on the other hand, is it instead engineers a cavity that's fairly low in terms of quality factor. So here it only did about a thousand, uh, which yeah, it's not a very good cavity, but it makes this overlap coefficient very, very high. So it says that we can achieve better performance, not by making these, these cavities superior, um, but by improving the field overlap. Now, is this true that, that you know, this is the true way to, towards high performance? Who knows? This is just what the computer found during many runs of, of doing grading and optimization. We don't know if this is universal, but this is what it shows us. Um, another example is, again, getting back to this dipole flux enhancement problem. So here we're looking at um, engineering a surface over top of an implanted NV center. And what we're trying to do is extract as much radiation out of this NV center as possible. So this might have applications to quantum communication, so on and so on. But for us, let's just consider it as a pure optimization problem. We want to get as much flux through this monitor as possible for thinking about a classic dipole where we're able to engineer um, gallium phosphate structure within a small uh, thin layer on top of a diamond substrate. And so again, you put this on the computer, you use some kind of technique, it comes up with uh, a structure that sort of makes sense in terms of what you, you think of previously. So there's kind of like a bullseye thing going on that, that makes sense for, for outcoupling. That's, that's sort of a standard structure that people have come up with before, but there's a lot of different features in this. There's, there's more scattering features going on than you would definitely put in if you were designing it by hand. And the interesting thing about this in terms of what it shows is that the objective you put in really, really makes a difference. So again, if you were to ask me to do this problem, I probably wouldn't think about it in terms of radiation. I would think about it in terms of the local density of states. And I would say, well, the easiest thing to do is to enhance the local density of states. And I know that if I'm in a low loss um, medium, then, okay, the, dens the, the density of states, that's, that's a surrogate for how much power is drawn from the dipole. There's not really going to be that much absorbed power. So most of this is going to be radiated power. That's probably more or less the same thing as saying enhance the, the flux through this monitor. But what we find is that from the computational perspective, again, we don't know if this is true, but it turns out to be very different depending, at least in the algorithms that we run, which one of these two things you want, you tell the computer to do. So the two different lines shown here are the value of the enhancement, either in terms of flux or the local density of states, and the different um, markers are when we told the computer to use the flux objective or told the computer to use the LDOS objective. So you can see that the best performing um, structures in terms of actually getting flux out come when we use the flux objective and we look at flux enhancement. And for distances, when, when this NV center is, is not super close to the interface, there tends to be a, a pretty big difference between telling the computer to use flux or telling the computer to use the local density of states. So again, interesting and points to maybe some weaknesses in our, in our ideas of design. So we're probably not all that good at thinking about fields and we're probably, we probably make too many approximations. These are, these are kind of very interesting things that come out of the, the inverse design architectures that we see. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced uh, inverse design is interesting. It, gives better performance. It's, it's teaching us things about how we think about electromagnetic problems, um, hopefully things about the fundamental underlying physics. So what's the issue? Um, and there's a couple of things that keep popping up when you work on these problems. And it's rooted largely, I think, in, in terms of two branches. The first is that there's a non-convex relation between structure and scattering. Uh, and that, what I mean by that is through Maxwell's equations, if you change the, the scattering geometry, if you change your, your epsilon or your chi, you can't um, easily work out what the appropriate field solution is going to be. So in it, uh, for many 
for most structures actually. Only there's really only the case of very high symmetry structures is it true that you have closed form solutions. And for any other kind of you know scattering object you might think about, if you break this symmetry, then there isn't a closed form solution. And the relationship between doing a little perturbation and how your fields change is non-convex and very complicated. Uh, this is why we need computers. And because of this fact, it's very hard to gauge what kind of performance should be expected. So, you know, if an experimentalist comes to me or a theorist comes to me and says, you know, I want to do this thing, here's what we currently have. How much better, how much better could you make it by doing um, some kind of computational inverse design? It's very hard to give an answer to that question. Sometimes it comes out to be thousands of times better, tens of about 10,000 times better. Sometimes it ends up being pretty much the same as what intuition would suggest. Uh, the second thing that's difficult about this is it's hard to say when algorithms should stop. So because we have this kind of very complicated optimization landscape, we have to rely on local techniques. So we have to rely on things like, or for the most part, we have to rely on things like gradients or some kind of um, low accuracy surrogate models, so kind of like your machine learning models. We, we don't get to see the full optimization landscape. So we have to tell the algorithm sometime to stop. And we're not sure if we've actually found the best solution or not. Um, so deciding, you know, should I let my thing run for a week, a month? This is, this is very power, efficient, power um, hungry applications. They, they take a lot of time. You know, it takes a lot of your own personal research time. When should you stop an algorithm? When should you kind of rethink it? These are open questions that you, you can't easily answer. And this gets into the fact that the setup is also largely trial and error. So, you know, you can put, uh, you can put your problem on your supercomputer, you can change things a little bit and the answers can be completely different. And knowing how big to set your initial domain, that's kind of critical. You can waste weeks at a time, you know, trying different materials, trying different versions of algorithms, trying slightly different sizes before you hit on kind of a right combination that starts to give you good results. And again, this is just a huge waste of resources and time. But it gets to the more fundamental question of in these inverse designs. So they're showing us, they seem to be showing us something kind of deep about how electromagnetics works and how we think about it. But it's unclear what part of the results are physics, what part of the results are the algorithm, and what part of the results are just random, because we, we almost always have to do some kind of random initial seeding or something along these lines. And so to be more rigorous about this, kind of the, the fundamental seed that, that's behind all this is that it looks like for most of the applied sciences actually, but for the electromagnetic design problems in particular, uh, when you formulate them in terms of these pixels or your modeling cells, this turns out to be an NP-hard optimization problem, or at least it, it looks on its surface to be an NP-hard optimization problem, which means that there's very little hope uh, if you're to believe the computational complexity folks, that we will ever be able to solve these kind of problems efficiently. If we were able to solve these kind of problems efficiently, we could actually solve any computationally, uh, or sorry, any optimization problem efficiently, because the specific class that these electromagnetic design problems um, come, come in, you can, you can reframe any optimization problem you want in terms of something that looks like an electromagnetic design of actually just the linear susceptibility. So this is actually uh, kind of an interesting side effect. But practically, what this means is that there's this gap between, you know, what we're able to find computationally and optimality that we often know pretty much nothing about. And this, this is exactly why we can't give a good prediction. This is exactly why we can't Tell, know when the algorithm should stop. We can, we can use computational tools to look for heuristics or kind of approximations to these optimization problems, but we can't solve them exactly. And we can't solve them exactly because they're part of this very hard class of problems. And so there's this, this underlying gap that, um, that influences all of, all of these issues. So what can we do about this? Uh, I'm going to try to say that this is not hopeless and there's, there's quite a bit more we can learn and it comes through this idea of uh, duality. 
And it's based on two relaxations that we're going to use together. So the first relaxation or the first idea that goes into this is a very physically motivated idea. And this is a mean field kind of relaxation or, or an averaging, a kernel averaging. And if you've done any kind of computational modeling, the, the idea is fairly straightforward. Um, so just like in high energy physics, where you, you say, you know, maybe our, the, the physics we're talking about isn't actually true. Maybe it's just an approximation. But, you know, if there is an associated wavelength to the phenomena we're looking at, and in the case of Maxwell's equations, there, there definitely is, then as long as we get it right, kind of on average or, or over small enough cells that in comparison to the kind of length scale of the effects we're looking at, then the observables are going to be correct. And so in order to get physics right, when you're doing computational modeling, you don't need to, to get the field right down to the Pico scale often. You only have to get it right kind of below the wavelength and, you know, and a kind of standard rule of thumb is often one over 20 of the wavelength, depends on the material, one over 50, something like that. But once you get to little kernels of that size where physics, where, where the average is correct, then the observables that you see are actually very, very close to what, what you're gonna see in experiment. And so by kind of working your way down, you can go to a more and more accurate picture of um of modeling and this is this is the whole idea that we can do computational modeling in the first place but we can flip this idea on its head and say well if we just want to get an, an idea we want to get a rough estimate of, of what is going to be possible then we can actually look at larger chunks so we can look at larger integration kernels and although in reality there may be fluctuations of physics um, violations of, of your physical equations, so like Maxwell's equations may not come out to zero sort of thing. Within this volume, if you take the average over the volume, it will come out to zero, and so physics is true on average. And uh, by taking these larger volumes, we can start to make headway because the optimization problems become much easier. Uh, this is also a relaxation because whenever physics is true in terms of a smaller box, then and, and many smaller boxes inside a larger box, then it's going to be true on average over the larger box. So we're kind of layering things in a way that the by looking at larger volumes, that's always a relaxation of our problem, which means that the solutions of our problem will always be superior to what, what would happen if we actually forced physics to be true um, as close to reality as possible. And in order to do this, it's very useful uh, to think about the T operator perspective and, and scattered fields. So I'm gonna just briefly introduce this because it's gonna come up in the rest of the equations that I'm gonna show throughout the talk. It's not critical that you understand it, but uh, if you do, then it's gonna be helpful for, for piecing the rest of the talk together. The idea of this uh, scattering picture of Maxwell's equations is that you can frame everything in terms of a self-consistent approach together with the Green's function. So um, if you're kind of gonna think about this as a little picture, what it's really saying is you start with some initial current in a field, this generates an electromagnetic field. And if this electromagnetic field interacts with a object composed of some material, then this creates little polarization currents inside the material. And each one of these things acts as a source. So this is a uh, Huygens principle sort of, sort of thing. And each one of these little sources creates its own radiation pattern. And of course, this also interacts with the scattering object, so on and so on, until you get to the point that you have a self-consistent field solution. And because um, if, you're, if you're thinking about the case of linear media, then this whole process is linear. Um, everything, everything is described in terms of linear operators. And so there exists a linear operator called the T operator that takes you from the initial current uh, here, we're talking about some you know, initial dipole you can think of, to the total current, which includes all the polarization inside the object. And this is kind of like the self-consistent current that when you, when you take this total current and you just act with the free space Green's function, then that gives you the correct electromagnetic field. And then if you take that electromagnetic field and you know, act with the polarization of the medium back on this total electromagnetic field, it gives you back the same um, 
total polarization current. And so we can do an integral version of Maxwell's equations in terms of the self-consistent scattering constraints that ends up being totally equivalent. And now, okay, um, so, so what am I talking about here? In the first line, this is an operator equality, and it's saying that the identity over the scatterer or projection into the scattering object is equivalent to this T operator multiplied by its inverse, uh, where I'm talking about uh, operator multi multiplication. And so if we take this and we multiply it by another operator from the left, which is also the, the scattering T operator, then we can actually lift the geometry dependence out, out of this equation and turn it into something that's very useful for optimization. So why can we do this? Um, because this projection for the scattering object is limited to the volume of the object, just like the T operator, once you have kind of two copies of these operators, so you have something like ISPS and they, they happen in a row, then the projection into the scattering object is kind of redundant because the T operator is already going to do that for you. So it's already going to generate the total polarization current in the object and you no longer need to do a separate projection into the object. So you can get these integral relations by, by working with an appropriate linear functional. We often just use the the total polarization current itself, which we, we we're going to note as T because it's coming through the, the T operator, and then a specific projection kernel. So I'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's basically this idea of boxes. So we can take this um, equivalent Maxwell equation and we can write it in an integral form where the, the kind of domain of the integral is controlled by this P projection operator. And we can now talk about geometry in a completely implicit way. So everything about the geometry of the object is contained in T, whereas in the first equation, it's contained in this projection IS. So I would have to specifically spell out each uh, individual projection or each individual shape. Uh, so kind of from like a big picture, what we're doing is normally in Maxwell's equations, if I want to talk about a scattering object, I of course have to write down the associated uh, permittivity or permeability, susceptibility. And I have to, I have to write what, what that thing looks like. I have to say, where in space is it material? Where in space is it not material? But by doing this little trick in terms of the T operator, what I can do is I can actually just say, effectively, the whole domain that I want to do my structuring over is material. And everything about where I should have material or not is going to be contained within this specific optimization vector T. So this is going to be very helpful going forward because we no longer have to parameterize our, our geometry. The whole parameterization of the geometry is contained in the total polarization trick. The second idea is more optimization theoretic, and it has to do with something called duality. So this is, um, I guess, more appropriately Wolf duality or Lagrange duality. And it turns out to be actually the same thing, more or less, that you do when you switch between Lagrangian and Hamiltonian dynamics. So, so the transformation ends up being really, really similar. And this is an interesting connection. So when we write down our constraints in the manner that I just described using this T-operated picture, they all become these quadratic functions. So it's kind of like I have my initial field. I have some kind of um, projection kernel that determines an integral. So this is a volume integral form of Maxwell's equations. And each one of these things, if physics is properly satisfied, should be zero. And um, each one of the constraints, so independent of the particular volume that I choose, has the same form. So I get this huge collection of quadratic functions that are the constraints of my physics. And I can control how accurate I want those physics to be by making the projection volumes bigger or smaller. Now, in the case that your objective is also a quadratic function, which actually covers uh, all, all the kind of things that I showed before, it covers many, many different applications. Uh, again, not all applications, but it covers, it covers a large swath of them. Then your whole Lagrangian uh, becomes kind of a sum of quadratic functions. And this defines a quadratically constrained quadratic program. So this is kind of a well-known um, well functional form that occurs in optimization theory. 
where everything is quadratic in terms of the original um, optimization parameter t, which controls our geometry and everything else. And it's a fine in terms of the multipliers. These are your Lagrange multipliers that are associated with each one of the physical constraints that you impose. So you end up with this Lagrangian that describes your optimization. This is probably where you first learned about Lagrangians before they became something exclusively that you see in physics. This is an optimization Lagrangian. And um, it has these two interesting characteristics. So it's quadratic in terms of the overall field polarization, and it's a fine in terms of the multiplier values. The relaxation of Lagrange duality is to say, instead of solving this in the normal way, where I would have to take all the partial derivatives, make sure that all of the, the constraints are satisfied, go through this whole, uh, whole difficulty of, of solving Lagrangian, let's just say um, our multipliers take on some, some, some fixed value. Well, if all the multipliers take on some known set of values, then it's very easy to solve for the optimal T. And so from, we'll, we'll get into kind of a more pictorial version in one second, but the idea is that normally physics kind of makes this very, very complicated manifold. And by just giving a set of constraints, what we're, what we're kind of allowing the optimization to do is move away from this manifold um, at the price of some penalty. So if we're on the manifold where physics is true, then each one of the constraints that we've imposed would be zero. This is, this is what signifies to us we have a physical equation. But if we just want to find the optimal T for some set of multiplier values, then these constraints that define our physics may not be zero. And that means that we've kind of strayed away from our solution manifold or our true physics manifold in a way to get a, a better value. And this defines the, the dual function. And this dual function has some really interesting properties. So because it includes all of our primal solutions or all these solutions where, where physics is actually true, it's always a bound on the primal problem. And um, because of this structure that we're, we're not specifically tied to the solution manifold, it turns out to always be convex in terms of the multiplier values. And convex functions are very nice to work with from optimization theory. So they have unique solutions and there's very well-developed ways to find these unique solutions that are, that are computationally efficient. So we've gone from a problem that's presumably NP-hard. Uh, we've done two levels of relaxation. We removed some of the physics by, by doing kind of a mean field approximation that we can control. And then we're gonna do a second level of relaxation in terms of optimization duality that now gives us bounds on terms of uh, something that we can solve easily and bounds on the optimizations that we want to solve. So uh, maybe we're getting lost in the woods a little bit. We now have a way, a uh, big picture, to give an answer to the problem of, well, what, what's the best performance that I can expect? I can give you a number based on these, this sequence of relaxations for any kind of optimization problem you would want to consider. You can, you know, you can specify a domain, you can specify material, and then using this machinery turning the crank, you can come up with a number that says, and this, this number is always going to be bigger or smaller, depending on how you're phrasing your optimization, than what you could ever achieve with an actual structure. Um, so just before we leave this point, this picture is a little bit complicated, so we won't spend too much time on it, but this is sort of an idea of, of what this duality transformation is doing. Here we have um, a simple Lagrangian in terms of one constraint. And then we're looking at three different mu multiplier values. So we, we just have one constraint, one value of mu. And these define different, different sheets, whereas the actual constraint itself, where, where the constraint would be zero, is kind of this, this parabolic set. And what the dual is, is rather than being stuck on the intersection of, of all these three sheets where, where the constraint is actually zero, the dual is taking the supremum over each one of the, the sheets or finding the maximum value in each one of the sheets. And this problem is a lot easier because you don't have to, you don't have to deal with the curviness of the curve. You just have to deal with the curviness of the sheet, so to say. And this ends up being a much simpler problem. In this case, things are strongly dual. Uh, I won't talk about that too much, but it's important to note that the relaxation techniques that I'm, that I'm talking about don't always give you 
an answer to the original optimization problem. There is possibly a, a, a level of gap where the number that you come up with is specifically not achievable. So it's definitely bigger or smaller, not equal. Uh, and that's a little bit of a nuance that we can talk about later. Uh, so just quickly, again, a few interesting things about this dual. It amalgamates many previous techniques that have been um, thought about for how you do bounds. So it kind of brings together ideas of, of mode analysis. It brings together these kind of ideas of maximum polarization current, and it treats them all simultaneously. I'm going to show you some examples where just imposing a few constraints tends to be good enough to get a lot of very interesting um, kind of physical intuition back. In the end, uh, this is kind of a subtle point, but it turns out that any one of these bounds actually comes out to one constraint. So whenever, whenever this technique is used, it in, in the end gives you one quadratic function. So one kind of like physical integration kernel with different values for this projection matrix that specifies completely why you're only able to do this design to such and such level, or you're only able to achieve this kind of value for the particular optimization problem you're looking at. Uh, and we think this is, this is really cool. And uh, the other interesting things about the dual is that it works very, very well with many of the primal or, or straightforward direct optimization strategies you might want to consider. You can use these, the solutions that come out of the dual to act as uh, seeds or termination conditions. So how you start your algorithm, how you end your algorithm. And it looks like it can be integrated really well with standard inverse models in order to help give a kind of global perspective to the approximations or, or local techniques that you're using. So uh, a couple examples, here's some, here's some bounds we did on far field scattering. So what you're looking at is the total scattering cross section. And we have a plane wave coming in, we have a ball where our structure must fit inside. And we're trying to say, okay, computer, try to give me the, the structure that maximizes the cross-section ratio. So the scattering cross-section compared to this geometric cross-section of the ball. And we're doing to do this for, for metals and dielectrics. Just subject to the imposition of two constraints, which are the conservation of resistive and reactive power over the total domain. And these uh, correspond to the two different sets of curves. So in the solid curves, we're imposing both these things, both real and reactive power must be conserved. In the dash curves, we're only imposing that resistive or real power must be conserved. And you see first that when we just do these, these two constraints together, they match up really, really well with inverse design. So all these little dots that you see uh, with the increasing radius of the spherical boundary, these correspond to values achieved by some inverse design that the computer came up with. And these are shown as a uh, full structure and a cross cut for, for one of the specific points in each case for a metal and a dielectric. And you can see that um, they're, they're colored to the corresponding curve. So the green points are really, really close to the green curve. The pink points are really, really close to the, to the pink curve. And so these bounds with, with just two pieces of physics already tell you a lot of the story. Uh, and it gets really interesting in, in terms of analysis. So for, for very small radii, these two, these two things tell you when you can get a resonance and when you cannot get a resonance. So for a metal, this means diluting to a plasmon condition. And so you get kind of like a metamaterial dilution factor that you need to reduce the overall permittivity of the metal until you can get to this plasmon condition. And that's the best you can do. And for dielectrics, it's just not possible to create uh, a resonance if, if your sphere is too small. It, you can't get the wavelength to fit for a given susceptibility value. And this creates uh, a resonance gap between thinking about just resistive power and thinking about resistive plus reactive power. And uh, yeah, so you're already seeing interesting things about where rally scattering happens, where resonances happen, and it allows you to predict a lot about how you should set up um, your design or what kind of materials you should think about if you want a particular level of performance. So we can do these kind of plots as a function of the susceptibility for different values of the radius and see, you know, what kind of materials should I think about? How should I set up my optimization problem? 
And uh, here's two given two particular examples, one for a very, very small radius that, that's on top, where you can see that you can only have resonant response if you have a metal. And if you have a, a very small particle, okay, that makes sense. It's very nice that the, you know, we only need two pieces of physics to see this and we can prove it rigorously that in the case of a very small object, if I want to maximize my scattering cross-section, I need a metal. And if we go to slightly a larger radius, so now a half wavelength size, so full, full wavelength for the total diameter of the object, then we can see that these two things are very comparable, metals and dielectric. So positive, positive uh, material susceptibility for a dielectric, negative material susceptibility for a metal. And the comparison here isn't totally fair because in general, dielectrics tend to have much, much smaller values of, of loss or the imaginary part of the stuff's susceptibility. So this plot would actually show you that for a fairly large sphere, so about the wavelength size sphere, if I had complete control over engineering, I should really think about using a dielectric material rather than a metal. Uh, we can also do, we can also see similar predictive performance in terms of things like absorption and periodic gratings. So here we have, we're setting up a periodic structure. We're changing how big the period is uh, to, to use our inverse design. So on the left, we're doing a period of five wavelengths, two wavelengths, one wavelength. And we're looking at the absorption uh, divided by the period squared in comparison with the the bounds and the structures that are actually discovered by inverse design. And so we see really, really fast transitions in the bounds that come from the creation of these leaky mode cutoffs. And this is totally sticking with just this. We're imposing two constraints, real and reactive power and reactive power tells us, you know, you can't get a resonance. Here's the first time for this given film thickness for this given period that you're capable of creating such a mode. And it does a, a really great job of predicting when this is possible. And we can use this information to set up our designs uh, in an intelligent way and hopefully later to see them. So again, you can see that the, the inverse design dots are tracking really, really well um, with the given corresponding uh, balance line. And for metals, this is a much, much weaker dependence on film thickness. So again, you can do the comparison between, you know, should I be using a metal, should I be using a dielectric? Uh, we can also do things in terms of multiple channels and think about um, kind of more complicated things. So here's just a quick idea of a metal lens and the clusters that are shown in this picture correspond to the number of divisions we're doing of our design domain. So this is kind of like the tightness of controlling the physics. And in this example, you can see that as you control the physics tighter and tighter, the bound becomes closer and closer to what's predicted by inverse design, closer and closer to reality. So as you increase the number of clusters, as you increase the number of divisions, your divisions get smaller. Eventually these kind of approach the, the same level as the computational modeling. And this should be very, very close to the, the true physical fundamental optimization in this case, uh, the true optimum that you can achieve. And here we're looking at uh, the number of channels is the number of different angles that we're coming in with. So with increasing channel number, we're trying to make a design that maximizes the field intensity, not just for um, the normal incidence, which is your, your starting point, but also for all these different um, off diagonal angles. And again, the numbers here are not too critical just to show you that this is really an adaptable technique and it can do all kinds of different things in terms of considering multiple channels simultaneously, taking into account, um, you know, the scattering, mode counting, all these kind of things in a consistent and, and simultaneous manner. Uh, and so it's kind of a final example before, before I make a couple of closing remarks, we can also do kind of crazier things. So, so people would thought maybe uh, optics could be cool for, for doing these kind of math kernel problems. Could you, could you propose an integral, something like this that happens purely optically. And in this problem, we're, we're thinking about something like the little diagram shown in the bottom right hand corner of the left panel where we have a collection of dipoles ordered along the line. These are some distance from a design domain. And as you move along uh, a cut plane in between this dipole line and your design domain, you would see, you would see the field oscillate in, in some particular way. And our goal is to make the integral of, of that function that you would see be the output field on another cut plane on the other side. 
So this is kind of, can we implement the Volterra integral kernel in terms of just a purely optical scattering device? And uh, the objective that we're looking at is the loss function. So how close do we get, how close does the design get to, to achieving the, the perfect integral behavior? And we can see that um, it doesn't do so well in these cases. So as the number of transforms get higher, gets higher, the, the loss tends to increase. And uh, in the case of a weak dielectric, it's actually very close to vacuum. And so you might say, well, is this, is this a problem with your inverse design algorithm or is this the truth? And what the bound tells you is that, well, you definitely can't do better than a loss of 0.1, which is quite bad. So in this case, it's very close to the truth that this is just not possible to engineer with such a weak dielectric and such a, a thin design domain. Possibly if you change the parameters around, you could do much better, but for this specific case, it's, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and then on the right, we have a similar example with a stronger dielectric that also shows a okay, but not amazing uh, loss function value. So where are we going with this? Um, our, our real idea of uh, going forwards is to connect this all to inverse design, to use the solutions that come out of calculating the bounds as a way to inform what the inverse design should do. So when you calculate these bounds, you actually come up with a bound polarization current that may not respect all physics, but kind of respects physics on average over chunks. And so as you make these chunks smaller and smaller, it gives you more and more information about what it believes the optimal design should be. And so as we kind of go from this bounds QCQP and we increase the resolution of constraints, we get a limit polarization field that more and more closely should correspond to an optimal structure. And we're working currently on, on integrating this into our inverse design algorithms. And finally, there's a very interesting connection um, here to this idea that these problems are actually NP hard. So the conservation of resistive power shows that your polarization currents are actually always restricted to compact domains. And because of this fact, you can apply something from optimization theory known as Simon's uh, Minimax theorem. And this lets you do all sorts of interesting things in terms of changing your bounds um, algorithm a little bit in order to possibly give you near optimal structures. So I'll probably answer that more in questions later. I think I'm already running a little bit behind, so we'll, so we'll just leave it at that for now. Um, here are a few references. If you're interested in our work, I would really suggest checking out, we, we recently did a review, physical limits and electromagnetism, start there, and then um, kind of working down towards our more theoretical work, the on science minimax theorem is definitely kind of our, our current best understanding of, of how all this is working. Uh, before I leave, we are definitely not the only people who are, who are working on this. Um, again, if you thought the work was kind of interesting, but maybe my presentation of it was not so good, then I would encourage you to check out uh, either the work by Yelena Vukovic, uh, Owen Miller, Mats Gustafsson, Kurt Schwab. These are all very good people working on very much related ideas. And this work is happening really quite quickly. So this idea that we can use bounds on QCQPs, use these optimization theoretic ideas to improve design, it, it's growing rapidly. So it's, it's a great time to get in if you, if you want to. All right. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you. And thank you to all the other people who have helped uh, with this work. And thank you to my funding agency. So yeah, happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Sean, uh, for a very nice talk. A lot of interesting things to discuss. Um, there is what I'd like to do now is um, go towards our discussion session. So I'll request Satwik to go ahead and stop the stream streaming, and then we'll uh, start.